Thank you, Clint. Thank you so much. How are we doing today, church? Uh, that's like a half good. That's a half good. I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. I love Sundays. Sunday is my favorite day of the week. Um, that's, thank you, Jordan. Can we give Jordan a round of applause? Jordan's an introvert, so he loved that. So you guys, you guys probably made his, made his day there. So, so I'm excited about today. As always, I am excited because it's Sunday, but we're talking about something that really impacts all of us, and it, it's this topic around fear. And, and the reason that we call that sort of risky business is because it's, it's, we take a risk. You know, you take a risk when you confront your fears. Every day for some people, you're taking a risk just to get out of your house. But Today, we're going to learn how to, something special is going to happen today. Today, we're going to conquer some fears. So I, I just want you to prepare your heart, prepare your mind for what we're going to talk about today. And if you're sitting there now and there's a risk that you're afraid to take or there's fears that are conquering you or there's something that's conquering you, then I want you to know today is your opportunity that we're going to get freedom from those. So I'm excited about today because I believe that somebody in this room today is going to walk away and be more free than you were when you came in here. I can't take your fears away, but what I can do is communicate something to you through God's love that can change your week, change your life, help you to just accept something that has been really hard for you to accept. So we're going to jump into it. I want to start off by asking kind of a, a fun question. What would you be willing to try if you knew that you could not fail? So what is it that you'd be willing to try if you knew that you could not fail? Now, when you see this question, I think for a lot of people, you think about stuff like, well... Maybe I would try changing a job, or I would try moving, or I would step out of a relationship, or for some of us, it's I would ask that person out, and I would try and step into a relationship. But when I think about this question, what steps out to me, what stands out the most to me is, is if you knew that you could not fail, what is it that you would be willing to try? That means that there is an implied failure rate of 0%. That means that whatever it is that you choose to answer this question with, you cannot fail. That means that there is a 100% chance that you will succeed in whatever it is that you answer this question with. And so when I read this question, I think of something a lot more imaginative, something a lot more magical or fantastical. I think of things, if I were to answer this question, then I would, I would go out and I would buy a lottery ticket. Because if I bought a lottery ticket and I was guaranteed not to fail, I'd be a millionaire. Or I would maybe go to the top of a building and jump off and learn how to fly. So you guys think about boring things. I think about things that, that are a bit more exciting, things that have nothing to do with, with my actual day-to-day -day life. But this idea of if I could not fail, removing failure, what is it that I would choose or what is it that I would try and do? Now I'll ask you a second question that is a little bit similar. And in fact, if you look at it, you may think, well, this is the same question. It's just been rebranded. It's been put into different words. But no, 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 this is a different question. And so this question for you would be, what would you do if you were not afraid? See, this is different because the other question takes away the idea of failure. Whereas this question takes away the idea of fear. So if I take the jump off a building and learn to fly example, I may, I may say that, hey, I'm not afraid to try and learn how to fly by jumping off a building. But when I jump off, I'm still going to hit the ground. See, this has nothing to do with whether or not you fail or you succeed. This has to do with whether or not you're afraid or you're not afraid. See, we, we look at these two emotions in our life, these emotions of failure and then, and then this, this emotion of fear. We have failures in our life and we have fear that's in our life. And so I want us to look at this idea behind failure and fear. See, these two questions, they tackle these, these two things. And what I want you to think about is what is it that you would do differently if you didn't have to worry about failure? Or what is it in your life that you would do differently if you did not have to worry about fear? See, we spend the majority of our lives trying to avoid failure. We go around, we make our decisions so that we don't risk failing. We don't want to put ourselves out there in our relationships because we don't want to fail. We don't want to put ourselves out there in work because we don't want to fail. We don't want to start that new venture. We don't want to pick up our, our lives and move somewhere different and try something new because we don't want to fail. Some of us are not living the dreams that we have for our lives. And the reason that we're not doing that is because we are so afraid that there would be failure. So everybody has something that you're afraid that maybe if you try this, you're going to fail. The other thing that we try so hard to avoid is fear. 
just the idea of being afraid is, is an incredibly uh, daunting thing. You know, I, I grew up an extremely afraid kid. I slept with a nightlight in my room until I was probably a sophomore in high school because I was afraid. I grew up sleeping with my head under the covers, and I would lay in bed as a little kid have my head under the covers, and if my mom's listening, she'll chuckle at this, but I would poke a little a finger hole so that I could just get one eyeball out from under the covers, and I could, I could see my room, because obviously, if you're under the covers, you're way, I mean, nothing can touch you if you're under the covers, because your covers are magical. So if there is a Dracula or something in your bedroom, well, he can't get you as long as you're under the covers. So I grew up an extremely fearful kid. And I had to learn how to conquer that fear. And I still learn how to conquer that fear. But fear and failure is something that's in us. It's so deep in us. It's something that's so ingrained in us. And, and it happens when we, when we put ourselves out there. We make a decision to go for something. To really try and do something. We say, you know, I'm going to swallow my fear. And I'm going I'm to put myself out there in this relationship. I'm not going to be afraid of being hurt. And I'm going to go for it. Or we say, you know what, I'm no longer going to give in to this addiction that I have. I'm going to stand up to this addiction. I'm going to say no to it. And I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm not going to be afraid of possibly failing. But we don't do that. We're afraid to do that. And the reason that we're afraid to do that, something we talked about last week, is there's this, this rule that we live by. There's this, this thing that we've decided to prescribe to in our lives. And it's that if we risk nothing, then we can actually lose nothing. If we risk nothing... We can lose nothing. And on the surface, this is absolutely true. If you don't risk anything, then maybe there's not anything that you can lose. If you play it safe in life, if you stay in your house, if you never push uh, the boundaries of a relationship, if you never ask that person out, or if you never try and heal the broken relationship that you have with a family member or with a friend, or if you never try and excel in your job, or if you never try and kind of uh, do the things that are unique to you, because everyone in this room has something unique to you and to only you that you want to do that makes you who you are uniquely you and we don't do those things and you don't do those things because you think man if I risk it I can lose everything so therefore if I risk nothing then I can actually lose nothing but this is not true because what you lose is you lose opportunity you lose opportunity to grow you lose opportunity to conquer fear and failure you lose opportunity to experience life, to experience the abundant life that God has for us, to experience the abundant life that I believe that is set aside for, for all of you out there. But you miss out on opportunity. See, I don't want you to look back on your life when you get to a certain stage and look back and see a whole bunch of regret and think, man, I wish I had done this or I wish that I had taken that opportunity. I wish that I had, had not let that slip through my fingers. No one wants to have regret. That, that's the worst thing that can happen from this. You may think you're living a safe life by risking nothing. But what you're doing is you're building a bank account full of regret. And one day that bank account is going to have to be cashed in. And you're going to have to deal with the regret that you have or the regret that you don't have. And so what we've done is we have, and, and this, is, this is so basic to the way our minds work and the way that we as human beings work. We are so good at protecting ourselves. We, we are. We, we have been engineered by God to protect ourselves, to be able to, to overcome things, to overcome obstacles. I mean, one of the things that I love to learn about is, is when human beings have been, have been put through incredible trials. I mean, when you look at these, these horrific things that have happened in history, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is like the Holocaust. And you look at how people survive. I mean, that is a tragic, horrible, horrible thing that happened. But when you see how some people were able to survive that, you think, man, God put so much resiliency in the human body. And he put even more resiliency in the human spirit. And he put resiliency in the human mind. And he put resiliency in our emotions to love and to believe and to care. See, we were made with so much resiliency. We were made to push the limits, to push the boundaries, to be more than we ever thought that we could be. We were. We were made for that. We were designed that way. But because we're afraid or because we've experienced failure in our life, or because maybe we've been tricked into believing 
This lie for our life, we do this thing, we create for us this thing called the safety box. And the safety box is this area in your life, and we all have it. I have it. So if you have a safety box in your life, don't feel guilty. Don't feel ashamed. It's okay. Let's be honest today. Let's own up to all of these things. I have a safety box, and what a safety box is, this is a place that you retreat to, that you, retreat to, that you know is safe. So an example of this would be, you're, I, I love talking about, we've got a, a, a young guy here on staff that's in the process of learning these amazing relationship things, developing a relationship with somebody, and it's taken me and Casey back as we think back, as we, so we've been listening to how wonderful it is for two people to come together and get to know each other. And that's made Casey and I think back on our relationship where we thought, man, remember when we were getting to know each other and we were talking to each other and we were, you know, kind of feeling things out and kind of how exciting that was and how scary that was. And it made me think about my safety box. When I think about Casey and I's relationship, we would kind of push forward a little bit in our relationship and then I would get nervous or I would get scared and then I could kind of pull away. And what I would pull away into was radio silence, so I'm no longer on the phone or messaging or doing things like that. But I would kind of pull away and protect myself. In fact, I had a reputation in the States before I came to South Africa. I had this reputation with my friends where just every now and again, Chris would just drop off the radar and disappear for like three days. Now, I've gotten a lot better with that. I can't do that with a family. I can't do that with kids or with the, the job that I have here at the church. And thankfully, I've worked through a lot of that. And I don't need that kind of safety box anymore. But I don't want you to feel, feel bad or weird if your safety box is quite extreme. Because mine was at one point in time. So I would just drop off the radar. I would step into my little safety box and not message people or talk to people. I still went to work. But, but I would get really, really, really introverted. And that was my safety box. Relationships would get too close, I would retreat back. So what is it in your life that is your safety box? Or where is your safe zone? Where is it that you shriek back? Where is it that you don't want to push through the boundaries that would maybe make you afraid or make you feel like you could fail at something? You know, you could have a safety box in your job. You could have a safety box in your relationship with your family. You could have a safety box. Maybe uh, an addiction is your safety box. Maybe it's alcoholism. Maybe it's overeating. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's uh, what, whatever it is in your life. Addictions are very much safety boxes. Because even though we know it's not good for us, it's our comfort zone. It's something we know we can pull back into this. And we can just find comfort there. And this is not where I want us to stay. And today we're going to look at a story. We're going to look at an event that happened. And we're going to be in the book of Matthew. And what we're going to see in this, in this story about Jesus today is we're going to see what happens when a man decides that he's not going to live by fear and failure anymore. And this man is going to get out of his safety box. And he's going to take a step of faith. But... He's going to experience the same thing that we experience. When you step out of your box of safety and then life comes and life hits you and life shows up, it's everything in you just wants to step back into it. And this God does that. And we're going to look at what happens when he does that. And we're going to see how that applies to us. And I, I believe that at the end of this message, someone in this room, I hope multiple people, are going to find freedom and are going to walk away and say, my fears and my failures aren't cured but you know what? I'm willing to shut the door on the safety box. I'm willing to take a step into more freedom for my life. I'm, I'm willing to be just a little bit more bold. So we're going to jump into the story here. I'll give you a little bit of context. I love this, uh, this story. And so what Matthew has done here, Matthew's the author. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, the first of the Gospels. And Matthew is writing this down as a firsthand account. So everything that we read today, Matthew has, has written for us. This is an event. It happened. Matthew is recording it, not as a parable. Last week we talked about a parable, which is a story that Jesus told to emphasize a point or to help people learn something. This is something that really happened. It's not a parable. And so if we jump in here to verse 22, it says, Immediately he directed the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he sent the crowds away. So to give you a little context, this is Jesus talking. 
This is Matthew talking, but Jesus has sent the disciples away. But Jesus has just left. Um, uh, Jesus has just gotten news that John the Baptist has been beheaded. So John the Baptist was the guy that baptized Jesus, that made the way for Jesus. And John the Baptist was this guy that had a lot of respect from Jesus. And Jesus loved him very much. And, and John the Baptist did a lot of things. But he was put in jail. And King Herod, actually because of, of one of his mistresses, she said, you know, he said, I'll give you anything that you want. And she said, well, I want John the Baptist's head. And he thought, oh, man, I really wish you had asked for that. But sure, fine. So John the Baptist gets his head cut off. And so Jesus hears that John is dead. His head has been severed. So Jesus is trying to get away. He's trying to get a, a moment to himself, which just expresses to me that Jesus was so human. I mean, he, he felt the same emotions that, that we feel. And so Jesus is trying to get away and get alone, and he can't because these crowds, they keep following him. And so this crowd actually follows Jesus. And this is, this is the part in the story where they, they get hungry and the disciples say, we need to send them away. And Jesus, it, he has compassion on the crowd. It actually says that, that Jesus felt compassion for them. So even in his sadness, even in his sorrow, he feels compassion. And he does this big miracle where he feeds them all. And so they all get fed. And now the sun is going down and the day is ending. And Jesus is saying, I really, really need that alone time. I really, really need that alone time. And so, immediately, after he is done feeding people, feeding the 5,000, this is why he immediately sends the disciples away. Because he needs some alone time. So he says, disciples, you guys are fishermen. You know how to work a boat. You know how to work the Sea of Galilee. This is not anything new to you. Get in the boat. Go to the other side. And I'll follow you there. I'll meet you on that side. So they, they went. So then after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. So this is Jesus' desire to get alone and pray. And so then when it was evening, he was there alone. I, I don't know if you've ever been alone on a mountain, but it's a wonderful thing. I absolutely love it. I grew up in the mountains in East Tennessee and it was amazing to be alone in the mountains, especially at sunset, especially in the evening, and just to watch kind of the nothingness happen and nature all around you. And Jesus takes this moment where he just wants to sit there and be alone because he wants to connect with God. But also, Jesus needs to process some emotions that he's feeling. And so while Jesus is sitting there alone on a mountain, and when, when I thought about this, I thought, man... There's right now. Everyone in my house is sick. Um, COVID is, is it ha has lightened up enough that we don't have to wear masks. And when as soon as they take masks away, everyone gets a head cold. So now everyone thinks we have COVID, but we don't have COVID. Instead, we just have three sick kids with a common cold. And as I was typing this out this week, I actually thought of my wife. She would probably give anything in the world to be alone on a mountaintop. Uh, in the in the evening instead of taking care of all these kids in fact shout out to her in the moms and babies room she could not even get into this room because of fussy kids so so Jesus has done that and he, he he's there okay this, this is a special time for him so then if we if we keep going into this story here in verse 24 we read so now we go back to the disciples but the boat by this time was already a long distance from land and it was tossed and battered by the waves, for the wind was against them. See, the Sea of Galilee was not an intimidating sea. It wasn't that long. It wasn't that big. But it was famous for having these sudden storms that, that would come by. Now, these disciples, they were fishermen. They know how to work the boats. They know how to work the water. So this is not something that they are maybe uh, completely caught off guard for. But the point is, is that they're a long distance from land. They're not where they're trying to get to, but they're a long way off. And the boat is being tossed and battered by the waves, for the wind is against them. And then in the fourth watch of the night, so this is between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now, I want you to put yourself in, in their shoes and kind of put yourself in their context. Ignore the fact that they see a human walking on the ocean. What, what I think is interesting here is the disciples are not where they think that they should be. In the disciples' mind, and even in Jesus' mind, they should have already been across the ocean. They should have already been on the other side of the sea. This is like a two-hour paddle. 
This isn't an all-night thing or an all-day thing. But they've been paddling all day long, and they're being tossed and battered by the waves, and the wind is against them. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, when they should have been there hours and hours and hours ago, they're still in the ocean being tattered and battered by the wind and by the waves. And when I thought about this, I thought about us and I, I'd like to make kind of a, a, a metaphor, a little bit of a cheeky metaphor, but how many times in our life do we think that we're going to end up somewhere faster than we actually are going to end up there? How many times do we find ourselves thinking, I should be through this season of struggle? Wait a minute, in fact, this season that I'm in in my life wasn't even supposed to be a struggle. I, I should already, th- this should not even be difficult in my life, and yet I'm getting my lunch handed to me. I'm getting beaten, and I'm getting battered. You know, we... We, we find ourselves in a boat. We find ourselves trying to cross a sea that should be easy to cross, but we keep getting beaten by waves. We keep getting battered by the wind. And we find ourselves at 3 a.m. Because 3 a.m. is when life really settles in. That's when all the, the, the deepest, darkest thoughts come when you're laying in bed at night. And it's 3 a.m. And you think, I should be asleep. I should not be worried about this. This thing that's happened in my life with my kids or with my spouse or with my job, where did this come from? I cannot believe that this is even happening to me. Why is this happening to me? It shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't have this in my life. I should be on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This, was, this should have been an easy thing. It should have been a promise thing. So we find ourselves in the same mental space that the disciples probably found themselves in. I want you to identify with their frustration. I want you to identify with their hard work. I want you to identify with their exhaustion. I want you to identify with what it feels like in that moment where you think it's almost done and then it's not done. So, For, for example, in running marathons, the halfway point is not 13.1 miles or, or, or 22 kilometers. The halfway point is actually at mile 26 or at kilometer 40. Because those last two kilometers that you have to go, that, those feel like just as long as the first 40 that you've already run. Because in your mind, you're like, I should be done. I should already be there. This already should be over. That's a dangerous trap to fall into, but we fall into it all the time. And the disciples are probably there. So now let's go back to this moment where they see Jesus walking on the water. Actually, they see a person. They don't know who it is, but walking towards them. And so then we see in the next verse here, in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. because They didn't know it was Jesus. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. You're absolutely right that they would be afraid. It would be a terrifying thing. They don't know that Jesus can walk on water yet. Okay, we take this for granted when we read the verse. But no one knows Jesus can walk on water. And so after you've been battling the wind and battling the waves and and you've been fighting and fighting and fighting and you aren't where you think you should be all of a sudden you look out and you see something and you think is that real i mean this is how the legend of bigfoot is born this i'll tell you a funny story i I was running i used to run a lot and i don't run as much anymore now i do more weightlifting but in the when i when i was running a lot i was running a 100 mile race and it was my first ever 100 mile race that's 160 kilometers and I was about 20 hours into it, just solid running, running, running. And I had these three friends, and they were helping to pace me through the race. So at certain points in the race, they would come in, and they would, they would run with me. And so I had, I had, in my last eight miles to go in the race, I had one of my best friends. He joined with me, and he's running with me, and he's, he's you know, encouraging me. Chris, you know, you got to keep going. Come on, keep running. Chris, are you eating? Chris, now you need to eat something. So every 20 minutes... I had to, had to eat something to keep the calories in. And, and I remember a, a time when we kind of came down on this gravel road, and he was a little bit ahead of me. He was playing this game. Um, and moms, you do this to your kids, where you never let someone catch up to you. You just keep walking at a certain pace so that they stay the same distance behind you. And he was doing that, so I'm trying to catch up to him, but he keeps speeding up. And we have the same gap, and I'm like, I think he's running off and leaving me. And I look into the woods... And it's full of cows, but I think, I, I said, Michael, man, I think I see Bigfoot. I think, I think, I think, I think something's following us. And I believe it. I, I, with everything in me, I believe it. And I, I say to him, Michael, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me out here. Please don't leave. And I'm like having a breakdown. 
And my, he's like, it's not big. It's cows, man. It's cows. And I'm like, no, I saw something. You know, and I can imagine. And I, I was terrified. I, I was, it, it's silly to think back on it. But I genuinely, in that moment, had like goosebumps and was absolutely terrified. And, and that, that's something silly. Now, the disciples, they don't see Bigfoot. They see a person. They see Jesus walking on the water. And so they cry out in fear. And so now... Jesus is going to respond to him in verse 27. But immediately, I love the word immediately. I love knowing that sometimes Jesus doesn't mess around. He doesn't leave us hanging. So immediately he told the disciples to go away. Immediately Jesus speaks out to them saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. So he tells them, chill out. It's me. It's not a ghost. It's not Bigfoot. It's me. I'm walking on the water. Now something super interesting happens. Peter, and we know Peter to be the one that speaks before he thinks. We know Peter to be the one that's very bold. We know Peter to be the one that would go on and and cut someone's ear off to defend Jesus, but also deny Jesus three times in the same night. You know, Peter Peter was this this amazing type A personality, growing and bold and, and a little bit full of himself. And he replies out and he says, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, this is such an interesting thing, and I wonder why it is that, that he asked Jesus, hey, command me to come to you. Tell me to come to you. Is he testing Jesus? Is, is, is he trying to find out, okay, is this guy really Jesus? Is it not Jesus? Is he going to speak to me? Am I going to recognize his voice if he speaks to me? And we don't exactly know why Peter's doing what he's doing, but he says, hey, if it's you, command me to come out there on the water with you. So Jesus calls his bluff in verse 29. Jesus says, okay, fine, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water towards Jesus. Now this takes me back to these two words, failure and fear. And we talked about this in the beginning. But failure and fear in this moment. Peter, he had... No, he wasn't worried about failure. Failure would be, I step out of the boat and I sink you know, to the bottom of the ocean. Fear would be, I'm, I'm afraid of the wind and the waves, and so therefore I'm not even going to ask to step out of the boat or try and step out of the boat. See, this is one of those instances where you can see what happens when a person, just like you and me, Peter was real, he had doubts, just like you and me, when he dropped the failure and the fear from his life. He did this thing that we could say is full of faith. You know, Peter stepped out of the boat in faith. This is what pastors love to preach and teach, is Peter stepped out of the boat in faith. Maybe it was faith, but also maybe it was just obedience. You know, maybe Peter is wired in a way that it's easier to just do what he's been told. It's easier to be obedient than it is to be faithful. Or maybe it's a combination of the two. But the point is, is that look what happens when Peter drops failure And fear, he steps out of the boat. So now we go on to verse 30. Had this amazing thing happen. Peter stepped out of the boat, and he has taken steps on the water towards Jesus. It's not step out and immediately sink. It steps out, and he actually takes steps. He feels something solid under his feet while he walks on the ocean. And then in verse 30, Matthew tells us, But when he saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, this is the point in the story where I think we need to give Peter a break. I think we need to give Peter a a, a little bit of just kind of of an easy pass here. Okay, because Peter's done an amazing thing. He stepped out of the boat. Now, this is the point in a sermon where a pastor would say the easy thing to say. The easy thing to say is Peter should have had faith, and his faith is what got him out of the boat. And when his faith wavered, he started to sink. Peter should have had more faith. Peter, where was your faith? You'd already taken two steps in the water. You already felt something solid underneath your feet. Where was your faith? See, when your faith goes away, you begin to sink. When you take your eyes off Jesus and you put your eyes on the effects of the wind, then you begin to sink. That, that, that's, that's the easy thing to say. So I would tell you guys, hey, have faith. The reason you're sinking is because you don't have faith. The reason that you're sinking is because you've taken your eyes off of Jesus and you've put your eyes on the effects of the wind. 
which has frightened you and scared you. You've put your eyes on the world. You've put your eyes on the opposition. You've put your eyes on your fear and on your failures. So you need to have more faith. Amen, we're done. Have a good Sunday. See, I, I, I felt challenged in this. And you know what I thought about when I thought about this and I prayed about this and I said, no, there's something more here. And, and this, this thing came to me and it's, you know what? You are not supposed to be able to walk on water. No one in this room is supposed to be able to walk on water. Peter is not supposed to be able to walk on water. None of us were created with the ability to walk on water by our own will and by our own might. Peter was given an opportunity through faith, through obedience, because he asked for it to step out of the boat and he felt Solid ground under his feet when he walked on water, just like we do when we step out on faith. But there is nothing wrong with Peter because he starts to sink. There's nothing wrong with you because your faith wavers. There's nothing wrong with you because you take your eyes off Jesus and you put your eyes on your circumstances. Because you were not designed to walk on water. If you were designed to walk on water, then would you need Jesus? If you were designed to walk on water, how easy would it be to put your eyes on Jesus? Or how easy would it be to keep your eyes on yourself? Because in your own power and in your own might, you would be able to walk on water and say, hey, look at what I'm doing in faith. Look at what I'm doing in obedience. I think that Peter gets a bad rap here. Yes, Peter could have continued to have faith. I'm not trying to take away from the lesson here of how powerful faith and obedience are. What I'm trying to do is get us to understand that there is no guilt or condemnation in your sinking There is conviction that your sinking is due to your need for Jesus in your life. Okay? Now, so I want you to look at your your fears and at your failures. I want you to look at the places where you're sinking, where you feel the water come up over your ankles and come up over your knees. And all of a sudden, you're waist deep in the water. And instead of you sitting there saying, I need to have more faith, I need to have more faith, I need to have more faith. Instead, I want you to say, Jesus, I'm not designed to walk on water. And when you realize, I'm not designed to walk on water, and yes, I've taken my eyes off Jesus. I put my eyes on the things in my life that are hard for me. Well, you know what Jesus does? He does the same thing to us as he does to Peter, and we'll see it right here. Jesus immediately, there's that word again, immediately, Jesus extends his hand, and he catches him. And he says to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know what's interesting this, oh, you of little faith, it's actually one, one word in the Greek. And it's used like a name. And I thought about this, and I thought about this, and I thought about this. And I thought about my son, Benjamin, our three-year-old. And all the times when, when he does something, or, or I look at him and I say kind of, see, I told you so. See, I told you that you would be safe. See, I told you that I would catch you. See, I told you that the bath water was not too hot. See, Benjamin, I told you that I loved you. See, I told you, let me reinforce to you that I love you. Let me reinforce to you that I've got you. Let me reinforce to you that I understand that you don't have the faith to believe. But thankfully, you don't need the faith to believe. Instead, you've got Jesus who immediately catches you and then says, Oh, you little one, oh, you little one of little faith. Why did you doubt? Let me remind you that I've got you. Okay? See, this is where we can let go of the fear and the failure in our life because we can let go of the pressure that we've got to walk on water. And I, w- I want to leave you with this thought. And, and, and this is such a powerful thing for me. It's such a powerful thing. I know for, for so many of you out there, you're going to see this. And it, and it says, we, we have got... To stop being upset that we sank and be grateful for the one that's standing in front of you. you got to stop being worried that you're going to step out of the boat and you're going to sink. you got to stop being worried that that I'm going to take my eyes off of Jesus and I'm going to put my eyes on my own feet. Or I'm going to take my eyes off Christ and I'm going to put my eyes on the ocean. I'm going to put my eyes on the waves. you got to stop being afraid that you're going to fail Jesus or afraid that you're going to fail yourself. You've got to let go of all that. Yes, the wind, you know what? The wind and the waves, they don't stop here. And we've got to stop being worried about failure. And instead, stop being upset that you failed. 
Stop being upset that you went back into that addiction. Stop being upset that you didn't handle that relationship well. Stop being upset that you were a jerk in a meeting. Stop being upset that you yelled at your kids. Stop being upset for the things that you did wrong 30 years ago or the things that you did wrong yesterday or whatever it is in your life. Stop being upset. Let go of your regrets. Stop being upset about all your regrets and instead be grateful for Jesus who's standing in front of you saying, I've immediately got you. You weren't designed to walk on water. I was designed to carry you. And I've shown you through what I've done with Peter. This is Jesus talking. That, that I've shown you that what I've done through Peter, I'll do for you. You don't have to be able to walk on water. I will always catch you immediately. And so then from here, look at what happens. This is so comforting. It's absolutely comforting. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. It's amazing that Jesus got into Peter's you know, comfort zone. He got into the boat. And when they got in, after he'd grabbed him, they get in the boat, and the storm quietens. You know what's so beautiful about that? We get a little bit of courage. We step out of the boat. We have faith. We lose our faith. We get worried. We start to sink. Jesus immediately gets us. And then, you know what? He comes back with us into our life, and he brings calm to it. So even if you step out in faith and you sink, and Jesus has to grab you because your faith wavers, he's going to continue to walk with you back into your home, back into your life, back into your failures, back into your fears, and he can actually bring peace to that. So Jesus gets in the boat with these guys, and now the wind ceases, and then those in the boat worshiped him with all inspired reverence, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. See, this whole story started with a storm. It started with the disciples doing something that should not have taken as long as it took. And they rode right into a storm. And this storm, it rocked the boat. And it caused them to be terrified and fearful and exhausted. But look at where it ends. Because of one person's failed faith, which proves the great love of Jesus Christ for you. This event ends in worship with everyone on the boat worshiping God, saying, you truly are the Son of God. You see, the, this is the last thing I'll tell to you before we move on to worship. You will never know how trustworthy God is until you step out of the boat and let him catch you. Today's the day that you get to walk away with a little bit of freedom. Today is a day that I want to just challenge you to look at your life, look at where you feel afraid, look at where you're worried about failure. And I want you to remind yourself of the story that we've just worked through with Peter. This is a real story. And Peter's real, just like you guys are. He's human, just like you are. And you will never know how trustworthy God is until you step out of the boat and you let him catch you. This is so hard to do especially as we're adults. It's incredibly terrifying to do because we've fallen and we've not been caught. Because we've sank and we didn't have somebody to pick us up. It's because we failed and nobody came in to our life with us after it. Instead, we went home alone. We took our failures back home alone. Well, instead, maybe we can try leaning into Jesus and we can, we can let Jesus stand in front of us. And through that, we get to see how much Jesus loves us and how much he wants to catch us. And so I'm going to end the sermon here, and the band is going to come out, and they're going to play a song. I've asked the band to play the, the entire song. Sometimes we play a more abbreviated version of it, but I felt led today that today is a powerful day for somebody in this room. If your heart's beating fast, if you're one of those people that you know there's something in your mind that this is speaking to, this moment is for you. And, and I want to just give you a moment before we go out there, before we go have coffee and tea and before we're friendly and before the world takes over and before things happen and, and before you pick up your kids from their environments, before any of that happens, I want to give you an opportunity to do a couple things. I want to give you an opportunity to reflect on what it is we talked about today. And I want to give you an opportunity to worship. And what I mean by worship, whether that's you sitting quietly in your chair or you standing up and singing, 
I just want you to, as we worship in this next song, I want you to imagine Jesus standing right in front of you with a hand out ready to grab you if you fall. You weren't made to walk on water. You were made to need Jesus. And today, I, I, I so desperately want you to step into that. And so when the band comes out and sings, Jesus is in front of you. This is a moment for you to let him catch you. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you.